Let us pray. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth and faith and love and strength to follow on the path you set before us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to concentrate this morning upon an exceptionally controversial passage within the Gospel of Mark. Not so much the raising of the daughter of Jairus, which is in itself an amazing event, but in something far more profound and far more threatening and inexplicable in the modern world, which is the stilling of the storm. Because how on earth can you still a storm with a mere word? Today, people's hearts stop and they die and through the wonders of medicine are brought back to life. Equally, when Jesus casts out demons, we are disturbed less by this because psychiatric medicine struggles both to describe adequately and to locate and address effectively those destructive forces which are evident in some lives. Descriptions and diagnoses are neither precise nor irrefutable to exclude another set of terms from a different perspective. In other words, psychiatry is an art form, it is not a science. So we can accept resurrection from the dead, we can accept psychological cures, but stilling a storm with a word, tampering with the very laws of nature, poses us with an insurmountable difficulty. But this miracle story, this as with all the miracle stories in the gospel, weren't included to boggle the scientific and cynical minds of 21st century men and women. These stories were included in the gospel record to nourish our faith, and to nourish our faith whenever we live, whatever age we live in, and to remind us of God's love and of God's continuing care for us, whoever we are, wherever and whenever we live. So what do miracles stories have to say to us today, and what specifically does this calming of nature's storms have to say to us? Well, you may not have known, but actually seven of the twelve disciples were professional fishermen. So when Jesus suggests that they should cross the Sea of Galilee, which is not much bigger than a Scottish loch anyway, it was no big deal. It was a nice evening, the sun was probably shining, and a cool wind was blowing across the waters after a hot day. And they were probably just enjoying the passage. Indeed, it was so relaxing that Jesus fell asleep Now, when the fun that the sun metaphorically shines upon our lives and everything is going hunky-dory, it's incredibly easy to convince ourselves that we've got faith, great faith. And in such circumstances, because life is good and comfortable, we begin to delude ourselves that we really don't need God very much, except perhaps to give us the pat on the back, well done, good and faithful servant, when life is at its end and we enter into glory. Yet as we heard this morning in the reading from Job, just like us, Job had every reason to believe that his journey across life's sea would be uneventful, that he'd grow old and die in prosperity with the comfort of his wife and his children around him. What more could any of us wish for? But as Job discovered to his cost 
Unexpected storms arise out of nowhere and sweep everything that we value and love away. That evening, as the disciples were crossing this sea, really a loch or a lake, a storm engulfed them, and they were no longer in control. The unexpected took charge, and they lost it. Now, to be in control is a great feeling, and we like being in control. But being out of control isn't pleasant, and it can be sometimes terrifying. Mostly it isn't. We've all experienced instances whereby we're no longer in control. How often have we been stuck in a traffic jam? <laughs> London? <laughs> I mean, all the time. We twiddle our thumbs because we do nothing else. We may get angry, or we sit in a tube twiddling our thumbs, looking at other passengers, wondering what's happened because there's some problem further up the line. Or perhaps we're sitting in an airport and the plane's indefinitely delayed. Or perhaps it's even worse. You arrive in New York and discover your baggage is in Hong Kong. We've all had experiences like that. They can be annoying and frustrating particularly if we're in a hurry and have already cut things very fine. But we're powerless to affect the outcome. All we can do is wait and watch as the minutes tick by. And they aren't life-threatening, but I suppose they could be life-changing if we do it once too often and we're sacked, as can and does happen. But there are also occasions when despite our ingenuity and our technological know-how, we are profoundly threatened by the powers of death and destruction. And whether it's an incurable illness, a terrible accident, an act of terror, or mindless violence, or whether it's something intractable like global warming, the fact is that certain events render us powerless, helpless, impotent. And then just like the disciples, we're in a boat caught in a squall. And in such times, it seems to us that like Jesus, asleep in the boat, God is sleeping on the job because he doesn't seem to respond and if you've struggled through chemotherapy or radiotherapy or are having other types of treatment and we feel we're just holding on, if we are awakening in the middle of the night, swamped with fear and panic and tempted to cry out, Lord, you don't care. This story and every miracle story from Mark's gospel is there for you because it reminds you that Jesus is in that boat along by your side. And when that storm engulfs us, it's easy to forget that. And the word, the good news for all of us is that the risen Christ is with us today, saying quiet, silence, still, to these forces that are raging in our hearts and saying, no, no, that I am God. Secondly, if you remember, as the sea falls calm, Jesus looks around him at these so-called disciples who were no saints. They were men with feet of clay. Let's remember that. He looks around and asks, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? Because in fear and in turmoil, faith deserts us, and we start to clutch at any straw, and we forget to hold on to the Lord God Almighty. And he was simply reminding all of us of what seeps into our lives when we forget who is in control really. 
So when we decide to accommodate ourselves to the powers around us, rather than live out of the power of God within us, when we do that, we begin to believe more in the power of evil than of the power of good and of good's ultimate triumph. And when that happens, it isn't long before we become depressed and we really despair and we become swamped as we head for the bottom. And the message of the gospel and of the saints across the ages is that Jesus never promises we shan't be exhausted, we shan't be work-weary, we shan't be distressed or fearful. But He does promise again and again that we shall never be overcome. And as Tim read in the 107th Psalm, the psalmist recounted, when they, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and He guided them to their desired haven. So let's take Jesus at His word and offer to Him all the things that worry us, that drag us down, that depress us, and in trusting faith, just ask Him to carry us and the burdens that we carry as our Savior and our Lord, that this day we too might find peace for our souls in the storms that beset our lives. Finally, there's a text which says, opened mouth, the disciples looked at each other and asked, who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey Him. So our response to this whole event, to every miracle story in the Bible, including the resurrection on which our faith is based and built, is this. Who is Jesus? No man was more devoted to his wife than the essayist and philosopher Thomas Carlyle. And the story of his love for Jane Welsh is one of the world's great romantic stories. And when she died, he was gutted. He was grief-stricken. He was destroyed and became a shell of a man. Trying to comfort him, a friend took a New Testament and opened it at the 14th chapter of John's Gospel and read these familiar words, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I'd have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. I mutters Carlyle, if you were God, you may have the right to say that. But if you were only a man, what do you know more than I or any of us? And the question every page of the gospel asks us is, is Jesus a first century sage with a few tricks up his sleeve? Or is he Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, as the gospel record suggests again and again and again? And if he is, we should expect miracles of every kind, even though we can't demand them. We should accept them and pray for them. For after all, if Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and if he is, as it's claimed, has destroyed the power of death once and for all, forever, why should we be surprised that He can, like God, still the wind, heal the sick, give peace to the demented, and raise the dead? After all, with God, 
everything is possible.